Hi there, Mr. Holcomb here with another episode of The Math Behind the Modules. Okay, lesson 19, a big lesson. This is the inverse relationship between a logarithmic and an exponential function. So this is your introduction to inverse relations and what is an inverse? Well, if I have the fraction one fourth, and let's just say, and eh, not one fourth, hang on, I don't want a one. Let's say three quarters. And I ask you, what's the inverse of three quarters? Well, the inverse is just taking the numerator and switching it with the denominator and ending up with four over three. I can't write today, four thirds. So the inverse of three quarters is four thirds. So if we go way back to math seven, and we have some constant of proportionality and it equals y divided by x. And if this is my y and this is my x, well, then x becomes y and y becomes x. So inverse functions take x and y and interchange them. Another way we can talk about inverses is if I take 4 and I add 2, Okay, and let's see, how can I do this? So I'm adding two. Well, I'm going to get six. But if I then do the inverse operation to that six, in other words, take that two away, the inverse of two plus two is minus two. And if I subtract two from six, I end up with what I started with. So inverses undo operations. So another example is four times three gives me 12. But then if I divide 12 by that same three, I get back to four. So inverses undo operations. So if this was a function f, so four, f of four gave me six, and then g of uh, six gives me four, then the, the function g undoes what f did. Okay, so that's just a quick generalization of inverses. And if X interchanges with Y, then we're reflecting across the line Y equals X, which we did in lesson 18. So now this is all just gonna come around full circle. And no, we're not doing geometry, but I just got off on a tangent there. <laughs> all right, classwork opening exercise. A, consider the mapping diagram of the function F below. So here's the function F. One got mapped to three. 2 got mapped to 15, 3 got mapped to 8, 4 got mapped to negative 2, and 5 got mapped to 9. So the domain would be our x's, and the range would be our y's. Domain is your independent variable. Range is your dependent variable. All right? We're, we're imposing a function onto the domain to get an outcome range. So I did something to 1 to get 3. Okay, I did something to two to get 15. I did something to three to get eight and so on. Well, if the domain of F gives us Y and now the domain of G is negative two and it gives us four, then we would have three giving us something, eight giving us something, nine giving us something and 15 giving us something. So, That is basically, so how are we going to do this? Negative two got us back to four, there it is, okay? So we're just going backwards. So where did negative two come from? Well, do, the domain came from the range of F. So G's undoing it, so we wanna look at the range in F to make our domain in G. So here's my negative two, and then we work backwards, and that gave me a four, and there it is. So I'm just going to keep doing this. Where is three in F? It is right here. Going backwards, what did it result in? It resulted in a one, okay? And looking at eight, find eight in the range of F, undo the function F, going back to the domain would result in a three. And nine, where did nine go, come from? It came from right here, go backwards, that was a five and then finally 15 is over here 
work it backwards to the domain and it resulted in a two. Okay, so the domain of G becomes the range. So the range of G is actually the domain of F. Okay. All right, so now B says, write the set of input outcome pairs for the functions F and G by filling in the blanks below. The set F for the function F has been done for you. F is the point 1, 3, 2, 15, 3, comma, 8, 4, negative 2, and 5, 9. The first one is done for us. They gave us negative 2, 4 right there. And they were putting the domain in order from least to greatest. So it's 1, 2, 3, 4, 5. And they did this one first because negative 2 is the smallest of the range. So we're going to go in order now of the range. And the next nine is big, eight is big, smaller, then five, then three. Three is the next on the number line from negative two to the right. So I'm going to put the, this point here next, but I need to switch X and Y. So this is going to become three comma one. Okay, the next largest Y is five, um, no, that's a 15. Eight, here's eight. So that's the next one, eight comma three. So I just switch the Y with the X. And then I come over here to nine. Nine is less than 15. So I'm going to put the nine first. There's nine and five now becomes our range. Okay. And then finally 15 comma two is going to come last. So all we did there is switch X and Y and put them in order up from least to greatest with respect to our X's. Okay. Not too bad. Um, and now it says, how can the points in the G be obtained from the points in F? Okay, so the points in G can be obtained from the points in F by switching the first entry, the first coordinate, the X, with the second entry, second coordinate, the Y. That is, if we have the point A comma B is a point in F, then B comma A would be a point of G. All right. So D says, Peter studied the mapping diagrams of the functions F and G above and exclaimed, I can get the mapping diagram for G by simply taking the mapping diagram for F and reversing all of the arrows. OMG. Is he correct? All right. Okay. So it says here he is almost correct. It is true that he can reverse the arrows but he would also need to switch the domain and range labels to reflect that of the range of F is the domain of G and the domain of F is the range of G. Okay, so there's page one. Okay, so this is page two. And even though there's a whole bunch of stuff going on to get here, I'm just going in the teacher's edition, there's all kinds of things they want us to do. But for this video purpose, I'm just gonna get down to brass tacks and explain to you directly how to find the inverse of a function. So if we have f of x equals one minus four x, f of x just simply means, if you wanted to replace f of x, I say, what is y when x is a certain value? And that's what that usually means, or not usually, that's what it means. What is y when x is two, for instance? So if I plug the two in here, one minus four times two is eight, one minus eight is negative seven. What is y when x is two? Y is negative seven. And that's what that kind of function notation means. So we're trying to find y when x is a certain value. So to find the inverse of a function, the first thing we're going to do is switch from function notation to notation using y instead of f of x. So step one is always write y equals instead of f of x equals. So the first step is y equals one minus four x. Pretty simple, yes. The second step is to switch x with y. So from the previous page, you notice that when we did the inverse, x became y and y became x. So that's what we're going to do. So now x is going to be where y is and everything else stays where it is, just the two variables switch places. So now I have x equals one minus four y. So y became x, x became y, pretty easy step. And now all we have to do is go back and isolate the variable. So we're going to subtract one from both sides and I'm gonna get x minus one, these cancel, equals negative four y. And then to get rid of that negative four, I just simply divide by negative four because it's multiplication. 
and divide by negative four, and we end up with y on the right equals, and it's x minus one over negative four. Okay. So let's get rid of this negative sign. So I want four down here. So if I'm going to get rid of the negative down below, one of these has to be negative. So real quickly here, if I have a negative divided by a positive, that would be negative, okay? So a negative is when we have a negative in the numerator, a negative in the denominator, or a positive, or positive in the denominator, I mean, or a positive in the numerator and a negative in the denominator, or simply we just write a negative with a positive up above and a positive down below. All three of these mean the same thing. They're all going to be a negative fraction. So if I had the negative down here and I want it positive, well, the negative has to go up on top. So if I put this in parentheses here, then what I'm going to have to do is put the negative up top like so. And when that happens, what's going to happen is we're going to distribute the negative. So it's going to end up being negative X plus one or simply one minus X if we rearrange those two. So if you just flip the X and the one, that's the same as taking the negative of it. Okay, so if this was five, five minus one is four, and then negative is negative four. Well, if this is five, one minus five is negative four. So there you have it. So there is our equation. And then we would rename that g of x. So then I'd come up here and say, okay, inverse function g, it tells us right there. So then we change the y to g of x equals one minus x divided by four. Okay, now it says to graph it in the calculator, both of them. So if I turn my calculator on and I go to y equals and clear anything that's there, Put the original function in one minus four X, enter, and then put my new function, make sure you use parentheses, one minus X, close the parentheses, divided by four. Now, if I graph that, there's the original function, there's the other function, and I'm going to also graph Y equals X. And I'm going to graph that as a dashed line. And you can do that by, or can I? Yeah, right there. I just went over to here and kept hitting enter until I see dots. And now when I hit graph, there is my y equals x line. Now, this doesn't look like it's a perfect reflection. So I'm going to zoom, and it's going to square it if I hit zoom square down here. Where is it? Zoom square. Oh, it's right here, number five. Hello. That will just square the screen up so it looks more uniform. Okay, so this reflects across over here. This reflected across over here. So these are both reflections. It'd be better if I had the color calculator. And actually, maybe I'll just do this in GeoGebra. But I just wanted to show you the button uh, function on the TI-84 first. Okay, so it's much better to see this now in color. So the red line is my y equals x. The green line, as you can see over here, is our original function f of x, and g of x is 1 minus x divided by 4. So if I pick a point, say, say right here, 0, 1, reflect it, it becomes 1, 0. If I pick this point negative one five on the f of x function, one negative one five becomes five negative one on the inverse function g. Okay, so these are definitely reflections across y equals x. Okay, pretty cool. All right, so let's get back to this. Let's maximize this. Let's move on to number two. So now that I've shown you one, that's the exercise, but I didn't sh um, show you what the teacher's edition was leading this, leading up to to get to this. This was basically my example. So now try two and three on your own, pause the video, see if you can do it and then come back. All right, so here we go. Uh, step one, change f of x to y, x cubed minus three, switch the x and the y 
the first two steps are very simple. And then isolate the variable y. So I'm going to add 3 to the other side. So it's going to be x plus 3 equals y to the third power. And then we have to take the inverse of cubing, which is taking the cube root. So I'm going to take the cube root of both sides. And that is going to give me, and I'll just move the y over here now, y equals the cubed root of x plus 3. And then I'm going to call that g of x. And that is the cubed root of x plus 3. OK. OK, so this function here is much more noticeable that it is definitely a reflection across that red line y equals x. So as you see over here, I have the green one is my f of x, x cubed minus 3. The inverse of that is the cubed root of x plus 3. And sure enough, these are definitely reflections. You can check one point right there. Negative 2, 1 becomes 1, negative 2. Negative 3, 0 becomes 0, negative 3. And they meet right here at um, some decimal point. We can set them equal and solve, but I'm not going to take the time. It's an, it's an irrational number, probably. But there you have it. There is the reflection about y equals x. They are inverse functions when that happens. OK, next problem, number three. Now we're getting into a logarithm uh, for x greater than 0, of course, because we can't take the log of a negative. Actually, here we could because a negative squared becomes positive. But anyway, it might not happen with the inverse. So the first step is make f of x y equals 3 times the log of x squared. OK? Next step is switch x and y. x equals 3 log y squared. OK? And we're going to do our power rule. So x equals, and I'll just show it this time, 3 times 2 log y, which is 6 log y. OK, um, so x equals 6 log y. So I want to get rid of that um, log right here. So I'm going to divide both sides by log y. Um, actually, yeah, hang on before I do that. I want to get y by itself. So that's OK, I guess. So divide both sides by log y. Log, OK, let's see. Log y. Let me keep parentheses here. OK, so then we're going to, these are going to cancel. So let me move over to here. So now we have x over the log of y equals 6. OK, and a quick shortcut here. I guess I could have just moved the 6 over to the other side. I should have done that. So let me do that because I'm doing multiple steps here, too, too many or too many steps. All right, so let me just clear this out to here again. And this is x equals 6 log of y. OK, so at this point here, I can just divide by 6. Let's just do that instead. And that will cancel that out. And then we get the log of y equals x over 6. And using our exponential rule now, you take the log of the base, which is 10, to the power of what's on the other side of the equal sign, which is x over 6. And that is going to equal what we're taking the log of. So y equals 10 to the power of x over 6. And now we're going to change that to g of x. OK, so g of x equals 10 to the x over 6. OK, so now I'm going to graph that. OK, so here's the graph, and this is really interesting. Um, without me being able to um, limit my domain, restrict the domain to just taking positive, 
you need to ignore this side right here because you can take the log of a negative in this case because the negative squared is going to become positive. But if that x is negative in your inverse, it is not going to um, graph properly. So ignore this green portion over here on the negative side. So if you just look at when in the f of x function greater than zero, it is over here. It's this green curve here. And it does reflect across to this blue curve here, which is 10 to the power of x over 6. OK, number four, pause the video, see if you can do this. Come back, see how you did. All right, so here we go. Step one, convert the function notation to y equals 2 to the x minus 3. Step two, rearrange. So inter interchange the y and the x. OK, and so now that I have this, uh, put this into logarithmic uh, notation, log. So the base is 2. So this would turn into log base 2 of x equals y plus 3. OK, equals the power y plus 3. <clears throat> Um, I don't know why I changed plus. I just realized right there that it's minus. I always glance over and check my work. Uh, this is minus three, minus three, minus three, minus three. My apologies. And now to solve for y, we're just going to add three to both sides. So that's going to give us y on one side. Actually, let me not take up so much room. Uh, let's keep it on this side as well. So y, if I add three over to this side, it's going to be the log of base two of x plus three. And then finally, we're going to convert that to function notation. So I'm going to say g of x instead of y equals the log with base two of x plus three. OK, so there it is. And now we're going to graph it to see if it does reflect across y equals x. And that's a way to check your answer. And if it does not re reflect across, then we know we made a mistake. So here in, is the green 2 to the power of x minus 3. And the purple here is log base 2 of x plus 3, the inverse. And the red is y equals x. And sure enough, they do actually um, reflect across. So that is a reflection. OK, next question, number 5. It says f of x equals x plus 1 divided by x minus 1. OK, so in this one, what we will do is the first thing we're going to do, and x cannot equal 1, by the way, because 1 minus 1 is 0, and we can't divide by 0. <clears throat> so the first thing I do is change f of x to y. So y equals x plus 1 over x minus 1. The next step is I'm going to interchange my x's and my y's. So now it's going to be x equals y plus 1 over y minus 1. And then finally, I'm going to try to solve for y. So I'm going to multiply both sides by y minus 1 to get rid of my denominator. And these will cancel. And I'm going to get x times y minus 1 equals y plus 1. If I distribute, I get x, y minus x equals y plus 1. OK. And then. I'm going to get all my y's on one side and all my x's on the other. So I'm going to subtract y over to the other side. So this is going to be, let me just show it, minus y and a minus y. And that will give me x, y, minus y. And then I'm going to leave that minus x there for now, just so I'm not confusing you but eventually we could what we could have done was move the y subtract the y over here and add the x over here all in the same step but i'm just going to do it in two separate steps here just to show you and we're going to get x times y minus y these cancel equals x plus one okay now i'm going to factor out a y and that's going to give me x minus one here Take a y out, leaving x. Take a y out, leaving 1 equals x plus 1. And then finally, I divide by x minus 1 and divide by x minus 1. And these cancel. And I get y equal this. And I will now change that to g of x equals 
x plus one divided by x minus one. And I should also say for any x that is not equal to one, so this does not come out to be zero. Okay, so something interesting happened here. We got the same answer, f of x is g of x. So if I went to graph this, Okay, so what happened here was x plus one divided by x minus one. I didn't put g of x in because they're equal. So it would just be right on top and that would mean it coincides with it. So these two functions coincide. So think of them as both being right there. Well, if they reflect across, they're reflecting on top of itself. So this is still a reflection across y equals x even though the two functions are equal. Okay. Number six. Cindy thinks that the inverse of f of x equals x minus two is g of x equals two minus x. To justify her answer, she calculates f of two equals zero and then substitutes the output zero into g to get g of zero to equal two, which gives back the original input. Show that Cindy is incorrect by using other examples from the domain and range of f. Okay, so I'm just going to try a different value. So, here she did f of x. So what did she do? She did f of two. I'm going to do f of four. So if f of four would equal four minus two, then f of four equals two. And then g of x is g of x equals two minus x. So if I take my two and plug it in for x and I'm going to say g of two has to equal two minus x which is two and g of two equals zero so I didn't get back to four they're not equal I did not get back to four so she is incorrect I used another example and showed that just plugging that in does not work so g of x equals two minus x. Two minus x is not the inverse of x minus two. Number seven, after finding the inverse of several functions, Henry claims that every function must have an inverse. Rihanna says that his statement is not true and came up with the following example. If f of x equals the absolute value of x has an inverse, then because f of three and f of negative three both have the same output, the inverse function g would have to map three to both three and negative three simultaneously which violates the definition of a function. What is another example of a function without an inverse? Okay, so what they're basically saying is, think of a function that if you put on the x-axis and reflected it across, you know, let, me, let me do this more neatly than this. Okay, so what we're trying to get at here is if I had a coordinate plane, Here's my y-axis and here's my x-axis. And then I drew the line y equals x through it. Then I have a line, whoops, don't know what happened there, but let me try that again. Choose thinner, choose red. If I had a line that would go right through here and have a slope of one, then this is y equals x right here. So you have to think of something that, so in other words, the absolute value function would have looked like this. I would have graphed, um, what am I doing here? And let's do it in orange. So the absolute value function looks like this. So if I reflect that over the x-axis, this, if it was, right on that line y equals x, this line would become this, oops, would become this line over here reflected, okay? And then what they're basically saying is this is not a function because the vertical line test fails. There are two y values for the same x. That's what they're saying here. So they're saying, what is another function that would give me a scenario that does not work when I reflect it? Okay, and there's many. So if I just simply graph x squared a parabola, so let's just do this in GeoGebra. So let me go in here and delete, and let me put 
a squared there and hit enter. There is the parabola. And then I'm going to add y equals x. There it is. And if I reflect that across, then I'm going to get the square root of x plus or minus. Okay, so I'm going to get the square root Um, I don't know what that is, but anyway, the square root of x and enter. And then I also have to do it in two pieces. So then I'd have to do the negative square root of x. Okay, so here's what the parabola would look like reflected across y equals x. And as you can see, if I drew a vertical line, um, and that would be like, x equals four, there's my vertical line right there. The parabola hits at four, two and four, negative two. So this is not a function. So there's another one, the answer to that problem. There's many of them. Any function that reflected is no longer a function, but we could also say x squared does not have an inverse. Okay, page four is an example. It says to consider the function f of x equals two to the x plus one, whose graph is shown in the, to the right. What are the domain and range of f? So domain are all x values. So this is going to negative infinity, it'll never stop. And this is going up and it's gonna to continue to the right forever. So it's also never going to stop. So the domain is a set of all reals. The range on the other hand, y values, it will go up forever. So to the right or, or up, it's going to be positive infinity. But as we're going down, we're going to approach zero, but never cross. So the domain and range are in words. Um, since the function h of x equals 2 to the x has a domain of all real numbers and a range of zero to infinity, we know that the translated function f of x equals 2x plus 1 has the same domain, all reals, and range from 1 to zero, uh, infinity. Okay, so this is uh, two, to, 2 to the x is the parent function, plus 1 is shifting it up 1. Okay, uh, B says sketch the graph of the inverse function g on the graph. What type of function do you expect g to be? Okay, so here is the graph. The blue function was given, reflected across y equals x, and there it is. And that would have been the inverse function. And it says, what is the domain and range of g? Actually, it says, what type of function do you expect g to be? So since the logarithmic and exponential functions are inverses of each other, which is what we've come to the conclusion, g should be some of form of the logarithmic function shown in green. Okay, so part C says, what are the domain and range of G? Well, again, domain now is restricted to positives, zero to infinity, and the range is now all reals. So it's the opposite of its inverse. Okay, so the range of G is all reals and the domain is one to infinity. Oh yes, it's one, not zero, because it got shifted to the right one which makes sense since the range of G is the domain of F and the domain of G is the range of F. So instead of going from one to infinity here, and actually I said this went down to zero before it doesn't, it's one because of that plus one shifting it up. That is now our new, what's called an asymptote. Okay, now it says to find the formula for G. Well, they kind of already gave it to us in the picture here when I plop that in here, but let's work it. So we're going to say F of X, equals two to the x plus one. Change your function notation to y, switch your x and your y, and then convert to logarithm. The log base two of x equals our exponent. Get y by itself, the log base two of x minus one equals y, and then put it in function notation, calling it g, would be log 
base two of, I don't know what lug is, lugi, log base two of x minus one. And there it is right there. And actually it's the whole thing that is true. Um, so we aren't subtracting one from the log. We're just, we're taking the log of the whole thing minus one. So my parentheses were in the wrong place. There we go, that's better. Okay, so that's how we convert that to find its inverse. Page five brings us to the end of lesson 19. Review the lesson summary on inverse functions and go to your problem set.